Greetings, fellow detectives. Wizard Kitten here, bringing you a new Nancy Drew analysis video. Today's video is brought to you by the patrons over at Mystique Manor and by all the official fellow detective channel members. If you too would like to support the channel and gain access to exclusive features, check out patreon.com slash wizardkitten to become a patron, or click join next to the subscribe button to become an official fellow detective. I've been a voracious Nancy Drew PC Games fan for over a decade, and my obsession was already alive and well during the glory days of Her Interactive. The Her Interactive website had bustling message boards where fellow detectives could post theories, give advice, discuss their favorite elements of the games, and give opinions about new game changes. One of the biggest moments that I remember, a moment that shook the message boards, was when the UI, or user interface, changed from the Nancy's Room style to the modern style, first used by Nancy Drew, Tomb of the Lost Queen. I'll be honest, at the time I didn't quite get what all of the hullabaloo was about. The game still functioned as point-and-click mysteries, just in different ways. The mouse, loading screen, and inventory system changed, but that's all it seemed to me. A change. Sure, I was nostalgic for the stack of burgundy books that I had come to know and love during the classical era, but I was willing to try something new for a more modern, full-screen, sleek look. I'm sure some fellow detectives felt as I did, but others had a much stronger reaction to this change. I have also been asked several times to go through and analyze the user interfaces of the games, which has me thinking that there might be a lot more to these UIs than may first meet the eye. Some fellow detectives associate them with nostalgia, others associate them with functionality, others use them exclusively to divide the different eras of the Nancy Drew games, etc. So let's get to know the UIs a little bit better. Let's talk pros and cons of each UI, as well as discuss the evolution of the UIs over time, and what that evolution meant to fans. The first UI of the series was also the second longest lasting, spanning from the first game in the Nancy Drew series, Secrets Can Kill, all the way through game number 9, Danger on Deception Island. This UI is characterized by several iconic and nostalgic features for many fellow detectives, including the stack of burgundy books that function as the game's title screen, accompanied by the original Nancy Drew theme song. During gameplay, the entire screen is surrounded by a teal border, with the actual game window in the center. Two silhouettes of Nancy sit on the left and right sides of the border, while the bottom is significantly larger, taking up approximately one-third of the screen space. The left portion of the bottom bar serves as a text box when Nancy has conversations with suspects. The text is large, bold, and in a serif font. The right portion of the bottom bar serves as Nancy's inventory. Four inventory items at a time are always visible, with the most recently used items snapping to the top. Both the text box and the inventory have scroll bars that detectives can manually pull up or down to reveal more text or items. The mouse is in the shape of a magnifying glass, and it glows red when Nancy is able to pick up or interact with an item. The magnifying glass switches to a standard yellow arrow when choosing a dialogue option in the text box, and infrequently switches to a navigational arrow, usually when Nancy needs to move backward or forward within a space. Nancy moves in a standard, static, click-and-point style, with in-game animations appearing during certain sequences and scenes, and within certain locations. In order to include you lovely fellow detectives, I posted a poll on the community tab of the channel to see which interface detectives preferred, so I will be sharing your opinions throughout this video as well. On that note, only 9% of fellow detectives voted this interface as their favorite. I think the primary positive of this interface is the nostalgia. It is honestly difficult to beat just how iconic and memorable the stack of books and the original theme song are. This UI also introduced the glowing red magnifying glass and overall just had a very definable style. It was graceful and regal. However, it is easily the smallest interface in that it has by far the smallest amount of actual playable space. The text box and inventory are larger than they need to be, and the navigation overall can be pretty clunky. It's beautiful and memorable, but does suffer somewhat in the functionality department. 
The second UI of the series lasted for the shortest period of time, spanning only from game number 10, Secret of Shadow Ranch, through game number 15, Creature of Kapu Cave. This UI maintained several features of the original UI, with a few big modifications. The stack of burgundy books still functions as the game title screen, still accompanied by the original Nancy Drew theme song. During gameplay, there is a teal bar on the bottom of the screen, while the game image fills the remainder of the screen. The teal bar includes, from left to right, a menu icon, an inventory icon, a journal icon, and a phone icon. When the inventory icon is clicked, the inventory expands to fill the left side of the screen, showing all of the items that Nancy currently has in her inventory. In Secret of Shadow Ranch, detectives must pick up their desired item and then manually exit the inventory. In all subsequent games, the inventory automatically closes when the desired item is chosen. When the journal icon is clicked, a list of Nancy's written notes expands on the right side of the screen. When the phone icon is clicked, it appears in the same location. This UI was the first to introduce mobile phone capabilities to the games, though the phone isn't always fully functional given Nancy's location or email status. When Nancy speaks to a suspect, the teal bar at the bottom fully morphs into a text box with blue lettering and a large sans serif font. A bar on the left-hand side allows detectives to scroll through the text box options. The mouse appears as a standard yellow arrow when in the text box format, and as a yellow directional arrow depending on where Nancy attempts to navigate. The magnifying glass appears in non-navigable areas and still turns red when Nancy can pick up or interact with an item. Nancy continues to move in a standard, static, click and point style, with in-game animations appearing during certain sequences and scenes, and within certain locations. This UI received the second most votes by fellow detectives, with 27% voting it as their favorite. I think it's likely that many fellow detectives see this UI as a nice middle ground between the nostalgia of the first interface and the functionality of the next interface that we will discuss. This interface loses some of the grace and charm of the first interface, but maintains what seems to be the most important element, the stack of books title screen and original theme song. It expands the size of the playable screen and moves the inventory out of the way by allowing it to be minimized or maximized. This allows players to see the items clearly without them always being in the way. This interface also introduced several helpful elements, including a mobile phone and notes, the navigation has also improved by this point. Ultimately, this UI does still have a small playable area, but overall has more positives than drawbacks. The third UI of the series lasted the longest and spans all the way from game number 16, White Wolf of Icicle Creek, through game number 25, Alibi in Ashes. This UI introduced fellow detectives to the Nancy's Room game title screen, as well as a new Nancy Drew theme song. At the start of each game, Nancy would introduce the game with a spiel that many of us could recite verbatim in our sleep. Detectives then had the option to peruse multiple items on Nancy's desk, including a book titled How to Be a Detective. It's real helpful. A scrapbook that showcased all of Nancy's previous cases, a case file with information preparing detectives for the present mystery, occasionally a plane ticket to begin the mystery, a lamp to turn on and off as many times as your diabolical little heart desires, and knickknacks to admire from previous cases. During gameplay, the game images fill up the majority of the screen, while a seamless black border surrounds the screen. In the bottom left and right corners are four small stylized icons each, with eight total. In order from left to right, they function as the inventory, journal, task list, phone, settings, save game files, save game function, and exit function. When the inventory icon is clicked, a small square box opens in the upper right corner of the screen, revealing all of the items in Nancy's inventory. The inventory is closed manually. The journal, task list, and phone icons appear in the same location and function in the same way as the previous interface, though the phone sometimes does just appear as text options rather than a regular phone. This depends on the game. When Nancy interacts with a suspect, a text box appears above the bottom black bar on the lower right-hand side with yellow and blue text in a very small sans-serif font. The mouse functions the same as the previous interface. A standard yellow arrow for selecting dialogue options, yellow navigational arrows for moving through the environments, and a much smaller and gray magnifying glass for non-navigation or item selection. 
The magnifying glass glows red to suggest a closer look, and a hand icon appears for most functions that involve picking up, moving, or interacting with items. The standard, static, point-and-click style of navigation remains, with in-game animations appearing during certain sequences and scenes, and within certain locations. This UI was voted the favorite by a large majority, with 55% of fellow detectives choosing it as the best. And I can definitely see why. The only real drawback of this interface is that the mobile phone is easily the weakest. It's just a text box, which is hardly as fun as the actual physical mobile phones of the other UIs. Beyond that though, this interface is probably the most functional. It has all of the required features, like an expandable inventory and task list, while also introducing all of the fun of Nancy's room. The scrapbook, case file, and memorabilia are a great start to the game, and the whole desk sequence is highly nostalgic for many fellow detectives. The design is pretty minimalist, but it provides everything that Nancy needs while also significantly expanding the playable area when compared to previous UIs. The fourth interface, and the one that I personally remember causing a bit of a ruckus, lasted for a moderate amount of time and spanned game number 26, Tomb of the Lost Queen, through game number 32, Sea of Darkness. Nancy's room disappeared and was replaced with a title screen that included a screenshot of the game and the game's title, with several options listed at the bottom. The title screen was accompanied by one of the songs from the game soundtrack. During gameplay, the game images take up the largest amount of screen space yet, with only some black bars on the side. A stylized wooden bar with curved edges and red and gold accents lines the bottom of the screen. The menu and an icon representing Nancy's phone sit on the left side of the bar. When clicked upon, the phone expands into a smartphone with various functionalities depending on the game. Nancy's inventory spans horizontally across the middle or portion of the bar, with items across the bar always visible. The inventory does not expand, but a bar across the top allows detectives to scroll through the various items. On the right-hand side of the bar, an expandable task list and journal can be alternately pulled up to reveal notes on the side. When Nancy interacts with characters, a black text box appears above the bar at the bottom middle of the screen. The text is small, yellow, or bluish-white with a sans-serif font. The mouse functionality is the same as the previous two UIs. A standard red and gold arrow for choosing dialogue options, yellow directional arrows for navigation, and a return to a red and gold stylized magnifying glass for non-navigable spaces. The magnifying glass glows white to indicate that a closer look is required, and a hand icon appears for interaction with items. The games continue to use a standard static point-and-click style of navigation, with in-game animations appearing during certain sequences and scenes, and within certain locations. Like the first interface, this interface was one of the least preferred, with 9% of fellow detectives voting it as their favorite. I find the opinions on this interface interesting, because it actually has a lot in common with the first two. It uses a more grand and artistic design, it goes back to a constantly visible inventory, and it resumes use of the decorative slash functional bottom bar. It should therefore probably have more votes like the second interface, but it doesn't. I think this primarily comes down to nostalgia. While the first two interfaces were more grand than functional, they were also the first interfaces for many fellow detectives and therefore more memorable. This modern UI, on the other hand, took away Nancy's desk and is a lot less likely to get the nostalgia bonus. While it theoretically combined the best of both worlds, i.e. grand design with sleek functionality, in practice, it just didn't seem to work as well for most fellow detectives. The final interface has, at this point in time, only been used for one Nancy Drew game, the most recent game, number 33, Midnight in Salem. This interface continues in the same vein as the last interface, in that it utilizes a title screen with a screenshot for the game, and the game's title with a list of possible options. It is also accompanied by a song from the game's soundtrack. During gameplay, the game images take up the entire screen. There are no borders or bars. An expandable menu is situated in the upper left-hand corner, and a small inventory of black boxes floats in the bottom middle of the screen. Items in the boxes are visible as white silhouettes of the actual objects. An icon of a phone sits to the left-hand side of the inventory. When clicked, the phone expands into an interactable smartphone. 
When Nancy enters a conversation with a character, the inventory and phone icons disappear. The inventory also disappears during certain puzzles. Within conversations, a black text box appears with closed caption-like formatting. The text is medium-sized and white with a sans serif font. Each line is prefaced with the name of the character who says the line in yellow. The mouse appears as a standard white arrow in all non-navigable areas and as a white directional arrow for navigation. A hand icon is occasionally used for interacting with items. A magnifying glass is used sporadically and infrequently. This is the only interface that doesn't make use of a standard, static, point-and-click style. While the player navigates through point-and-click and can only stand in particular locations, Nancy appears to float from location to location. Cutscenes are used frequently, where Nancy's character moves fully through the environment without player control. As far as preference goes, not a single fellow detective voted this interface as their favorite. What can I say, her interactive? I told you so. We can pretend that Midnight in Salem is some grand success with cutting-edge technology and a slick new interface that everyone asked for, but the numbers don't lie. Zero percent of fellow detectives prefer this UI. Not only does the navigation suck worse than the games that were made in 2000, but the design has no charm, character, and frankly not even functionality. It's minimally functional, like the bare minimum. The only positive that I can give it is that it does in fact use the entire screen as a playable area, which is great. That's the only nice thing I can say, but it does exist. So there you have it, fellow detectives, a deep dive into the five user interfaces that have been used in the Nancy Drew series. I think if I ultimately had to choose my favorite, I'd probably say the second interface for its combination of charm and functionality, but there are genuinely things I love about the main four. There are some that I appreciate more than others, but ultimately they all have their pros and cons. The importance of those pros and cons are probably what make or break a particular interface for some fellow detectives, while others may feel more or less neutral about them. Either way, I really enjoyed putting my magnifying glass to these interfaces and examining their evolution. But what do you think, fellow detectives? What are your favorite and least favorite interfaces? Why do you like certain interfaces over others? What's the most important thing to you in a UI? Let a wizard kitten know in the comment section down below. If you really enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button or tipping me for the video with a super thanks next to the download button right beneath the video. If you would like to come join a fantastic group of fellow detectives at Mystique Manor as a patron for the channel, gain access to exclusive content, and support the making of more content like this, please check out patreon.com slash wizardkitten. I also have channel memberships with exclusive badges and emojis to use during streams and in the comments section. If you'd like to support the channel by becoming an official fellow detective, click join next to the subscribe button. Please feel free to follow the channel on Instagram or Discord, linked in the description box down below. And as always, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more Nancy Drew and Sims 4 content. Thank you so much for watching, fellow detectives. I will see you soon.